Okay, so welcome to our discussion session for the fifth theoretical exercise. And in this theoretical exercise, we had, uh, well, just two questions. There's unfortunately not that many, well, challenging or interesting questions, except for reproducing knowledge that you can do with the level we're discussing this on related to file system problems. But still, I hope I, I could find something that yeah, you could find interesting. So the first question and uh, well, as a hint, this might be a typical question in an exam uh, was about disk scheduling. So IO scheduling uh, and the problem with scheduling on real hard disks, so not SSDs is that there are physical components inside. So you have to move the head over the surface of the disk to access a certain track. So the tracks are these concentric circles that split your disk in separate areas. And then your disk rotates below the head. So you would also have to wait in a real hard disk uh, for the uh, right sector to just appear under your head while it rotates. So these are all the sorts of delays that can show up when you use a disk drive. And of course, when you use an SSD, it's just flash. So you can just apply a different address to your flash memory, which would just mean, well, uh, yeah, you don't have any positioning delays, but still we are using some hard disks today. And it's a nice example of how to optimize problems if you have sort of these uh, latencies involved. So we uh, simplified this a bit here. So we assumed a simple magnetic disk with eight tracks. And what was maybe a bit confusing because there was a number of questions on Piazza on this, uh, what is a read request? So we're saying after each second read request, the IO scheduler uh, receives additional read requests which are grouped together. So the first request that arrives is our request L1 here. And this request arrives at the same time and requests the, the tracks two, four, three, and one. And each of these tracks here is a single read request. So this means L1 is a single, uh, yeah, a single uh, group of read requests, which consists of four separate read requests. And after the second read request is executed, so two of them, then L2 comes in. And then after an additional two read requests, is ex are executed, then the third one arrives. And what our IO scheduling does is as soon as a new read request arrives, it reschedules all the outstanding read requests to, uh, well, conform to this uh, scheduling algorithm or scheduling order we uh, have in the question here. So our first question was about SSTF, so shortest seek time first. So shortest seek time considers the track you're currently on. And then uh, the uh, outstanding read requests are sorted in the order that the seeks are actually short. So that the number of tracks you have to change from one read request to the next is low. And we're starting at track zero. So at the outside of the disk here. And first we get this request 2431. Now when this request comes in, your IO scheduler reorders the complete set of requests here to be in SSTF order because it cannot know that in the future an additional request might come in. So the first step that's done is L1 is received and it's reordered according to shortest seek time first. And obviously since we're at track zero and we need to access tracks one, two, three, and four, well, we just do it in order because we have one step seek time to one and then yet another again to uh, reach uh, tracks two, three, and four respectively. So this is just the reordering. And then after it, the IO scheduler did the reordering, the reading can start. So it starts with reading track one and delivering it to the requester. Then it starts reading track two, delivering it to the requester. And then the IO scheduler receives this next request, which consists of a read requests for tracks five and six. So what our IO scheduler does, it looks at the outstanding read requests. So we've read track one and two at that point. So we delivered data back. So three and four are still outstanding here. 
and five and six are the two new ones that came in. So in step three here, we just reorder our list of requests. So we had three and four in there. And so according to shortest seek time first, we would then just add five and six in that order. Then we read another two of these read requests. So the first two here, three and four, and deliver them in step four. And after we delivered track four, we get another read request consisting of tracks zero and seven. And so now we order them in shortest seek time first again. So we know that we are up to five and six because of these still outstanding requests after step four. So we add step seven because it's only one step going there. And then we can go back outside all the way to step zero again, and then it's finished. So the order is really, really simple. Uh, so uh, if you try to solve this, you might've been confused that it looks so simple, but yes, that's essentially the order we get. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we have to do this big seek to go back to zero because we couldn't anticipate in the beginning that there was a request for track zero. So we had to order it afterwards. So the second part of that question was uh, more or less doing the same with a bit of a different uh, set of requests and a different algorithm. So in this part B, you were asked to use the elevator algorithm and the elevator algorithm is named that way because well, it works like a real elevator. So it doesn't just move up and down and up and down according to requests, but an elevator, at least in, in large buildings, tries to keep moving in one direction. So when it's moving upward and there's further requests further up, then it continues moving upward until there's no more requests above the current position of our elevator. And then it just starts going down again when there's requests down. So uh, again, after uh, two read requests each, we get these additional requests L2 and L3. And there was a stupid typo. So this four marked in red here in L2, that should have been a three. Uh, and so that might have been a bit confusing of what that meant. Let's see how it goes. So again, uh, in the beginning, we received our request L1, four tracks one, four, seven, and two. And we order them in elevator notation. So we're at track zero at the moment. So we know we have to go upwards, so inside, towards the inside of our track, track uh, of our disk to higher track numbers. So we order our request in the order of uh, ascending track numbers. So one, two, four, and seven. Then we read and deliver track one and track two, and then L2 comes in. And L2 is received and the requests are added to the remaining uh, two uh, outstanding read requests for track four and seven. And L2 now also contains a request for block four. So this would have resulted in four, four, six, seven, oh. And then the question would have been, uh, well, we're reading track four and then we're reading track four again. Now what's this? This is ambiguous. This is one read request or should we handle this as, as two read requests even though there's no write in between. So this would return essentially the same data. So, uh, if this would be the case, usually the IO controller would try to optimize. Uh, but as I said, this is a result of a typo. So we, that wasn't intended. So essentially it would only return track four once because well, uh, it doesn't make sense to transfer the identical data twice. So it would actually read tracks four and six next because the double four is just reduced to one. And so our outstanding requests would be seven and zero. So uh, then, uh, three is received containing track numbers five and two. So we had arrived at track six now. So we're still trying to go towards the inside toward higher track numbers. So we add, uh, we keep track seven in that list. And after we reach the highest number here, we're starting to go down again. And on the way down, we can deliver all the tracks we pass. So track five, track two, and finally track zero. So with this typo, our order would be one, two, four, Four, six, seven, five, two, zero. Uh, oh. Ha, yes. Okay, question on the chat. Don't the requests arrive after each third now, not second? Oh, yes. 
Yes, you're right. That's that's me stupid because I copy and pasted the question from part A and then change this and then build the solution according to this. All right. So let's change this online. So sorry about that. <laughs> ah, thanks for catching it. So let me see if I can change it on the fly. So yeah, that's <laughs> when you have too many Zoom meetings on the same time at the same time. That's not a good idea. So let me see if I can fix it. So we have four. So the question is if we have an ambiguity here. So this still holds, then we would read four, six, seven. Show this slide in a second. And then we would retrieve, we see this one here. I think the order doesn't change. I'll, I'll have to recheck it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that is a scheduling problem on my side because trying to solve this during another Zoom meeting was not the best idea. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Uh, well, I'm trying to share my screen again. Where is it going? There it is. Okay, I think we would still arrive at the same order, but I'll check this and uh, publish uh, the slides whenever I fix this. Uh, so yeah, thanks for noticing this. That was a mistake on my side, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, yes, uh, then, well, I corrected the typo, but this is then obviously still wrong because this is still the second read request. So I fix this in the slides. I think it's it's rather obvious what's going to happen now with the explanation. Sorry for that. Well, that was uh, then a double fault. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I hope I made a bit uh, fewer faults uh, for the second question. And this was a bit about uh, maybe getting you interested if you're interested in things like IT security. And let's say, uh, well, uh, just a very hypothet hypothetical case that, yeah, there's a criminal who uh, has data on a disk and police crashes into his apartment and the criminal just tries to delete his disk. And before he could continue and finish deleting his disk, part of that data was still there. And so the police took that disk and tried to reconstruct the data. And that's what you do when you do forensic analysis. So you try to piece together data that's still readable on the disk. And that can also happen if you're not catching criminals, but your disk has crashed or some other defects. And so essentially what you need to do is either by hand or by writing tools for this to actually interpret the structures that are found on the disk to figure out if there's anything meaningful in it. So uh, we have this structure here of a very simple example, the uh, FAT file system. And in this case, the, the simple one, FAT12, I think for floppy disks. And this consists of uh, directory entries and these directory entries have 32 bytes each. And the first bytes zero to 10 consists of file name and extension. And then we have some metadata like attributes like timestamps and the indication at which cluster uh, file starts and the file size in bytes. And your task was really to figure out for a given hex dump what uh, the file names and several of these metadata uh, would mean. So the first task was to figure out the name of the entry. Well, that was almost simple enough because well, we printed it on the right hand side but if you look closely, you may have noticed the difference here. So we printed it here as io.sys because we didn't want you to look up all the ASCII uh, characters here. 
Now, if you look on the left-hand side, what you see is it's not the, uh, exactly what's written on the right-hand side. So this here, 49 is an I, 4F is an O, that's correct. And then you see MS-DOS fills up the remaining characters, so the remaining six characters of the eight character file name, just with space characters here. And then directly we have S, Y, S, so 53, two S's here and 59, a Y in the middle. So MS-DOS doesn't store this dot character here because it always comes between character eight and character nine of your file name. So after the file name itself, before the extension, because it always comes, it's not actually stored. So even though we printed it there, well, it's nowhere to be found on disk. We have one special case here, this MS-DOS entry here. And even though this doesn't have any extension, this is still stored as three spaces here. And why, why did they do it in such a format like this would waste disk space? Now this makes handling the disk easier. Consider that this file system was running on a four megahertz processor or 4.77 megahertz processor, with it, uh, which initially came with 64 kilobytes in the original IBM PC. So you didn't really have that much space to store data, to store code. And so they tried to make it as simple as possible by just sacrificing some space on the disk to make the algorithms easier. I think at least that was the intention. So that was also the reason why they managed to, well, put many attributes inside of that single byte here. So byte 11 is the attribute byte. And this is just single bytes indicating properties of a file. So if bit zero is set, it would mean it's a read only file. Bit one would mean it's a hidden file. So certain system files on MS-DOS uh, floppy disks are hidden, so the user can't see them and try to delete them. For example, it might be the operating system kernel for MS-DOS itself. If you delete it, well, your computer can't boot anymore, so they chose to hide it. And then you can indicate it's a system file. It's a label for a volume, so a volume is just a disk or a floppy disk or uh, maybe even a partition on your disk. Bit 4 means it's a subdirectory. Bit five is an archive bit, which indicates that a backup program should consider that file. And there's some unused bits. And so, uh, as you see, the first 11 bytes were our file name and extension and the byte right after this is the attribute byte. So this is again written in hexadecimal and we have three different values here, 20, 27 and 28. So 20 in binary is that bit here. So bit five is set. So this would just mean it's an archive uh, metadata for that file. So this file should be archived. Whereas 27 means the least significant three bits are also set. So it's read only system file and hidden. And this is the sys files. Well, you could uh, already guess this is a system file. So msdos.sys is the kernel. io.sys is the interface to the PC BIOS doing IO functions here. And double space dot bin is a driver that was used uh, for uh, online file compression to uh, enable some more space on disks, which made it even slower. But still, that's also a driver. It's usually hidden. So when you do a directory listing, you wouldn't see io.sys, msdos.sys, and double space dot bin. So you wouldn't try to delete them. But of course, they exist because they're needed to boot an msdos system. And uh, so it's just hidden because, well, not to confuse the user. Now there's a one special entry here with the attribute of 28 or 28. And this means it's, an arc, uh, it's a volume label bit here. So that's bit, uh, we hear. Uh, uh, bit three here, right? So this eight here is the volume label. And that's exactly what our MS-DOS entry is. This is not a file. This is just an indication of the name of that specific disk. I think that was a floppy disk actually. So this disk is actually called MS-DOS. So when you have lots of floppy disks, you can give each floppy disk its own name. So you can figure out is it uh, whatever compiler's homework or operating system's homework or whatever. Well, nobody's using floppy disks any, uh, any longer, I suppose. So uh, that's, yeah, but you could do the same for like USB sticks, if you have a FAT file system on it and give them each a separate name. And that's exactly what, what shows up when you mount them uh, on, on a computer. So uh, then you uh, were supposed to find the starting cluster number and this is stored in bytes 26 to 27. 
So these are the ones we marked here in blue. And here you have to notice that this is little endian byte order. So uh, little endian byte order means the uh, least significant byte stands first and then, uh, well, the more significant bytes come after this. So this is a 16-bit value. So if we have the bytes 1D, 0, 0, we have to just flip them around to 0, 0, 1D. So for example, I would notice this would start at cluster number 29 in decimal. Uh, MS-DOS.sys would start at cluster number 109. And for example, finally, fdisk.exe, which is the uh, system program, so a real executable program to partition disks. This starts at cluster two, so 0002. And that's actually the first cluster available on an MS-DOS disk. And so for our volume header here, MS-DOS, uh, this actually starts at cluster zero, which indicates it's not a file, uh, well, or an empty file, as, as the description says, because it's just a volume label and not a real file. So it doesn't use any other data blocks on the disks, except for these 32 bytes of its entry here. Uh, so the question is, how do you find block numbers from this? So this depends on the cluster size of your uh, FAT file system. On a floppy disk, you would use the FAT12 file system which allows for cluster sizes from 512 bytes to four kilobytes and is usually 512 on floppy disks. So uh, fdisk.exe, for example, would start at cluster two. Each cluster is 512 bytes. We'll start counting at zero. So this would mean it would start at the first kilobyte of your disk. So this essentially was mostly finding the right bytes and then getting the order right. And finally, you were supposed to find out the file size. Well, that's exactly the same exercise, just using four bytes in little ending byte order. And so you see, well, even back then in old MS-DOS, uh, some parts could get rather big. So the MS-DOS kernel was 38 kilobytes. The IO drivers were 40 kilobytes. And this double space driver was even almost 65, 64 kilobytes. Uh, so, uh, with a typical disk which ranged from like 360 to, uh, kilobytes to 1.4 megabytes. You couldn't really store a lot on this. So people had to really, really uh, get creative to, to be able to fix, uh, to, to fit uh, yeah, a complete booting MS-DOS system on a floppy disk. So uh, that's, yeah, maybe you found it interesting. I know I did something like this as a student when I had a crashed Unix system at a company I was working for. And luckily I didn't crash the system, but somebody made a mistake when administering the system. And I had, well, my, one of my first tasks there was to really reconstruct that file system. That was a simple system, five file system. So just inodes and 14 character file names, luckily. And I actually got like 98% of the data back and since this was a non backup source code repository of a company that was doing custom software development, they were pretty happy about this, I suppose. So it's really real life applications here. You uh, can use this knowledge, but of course it's going down to the bits and bytes. Some find this interesting, some find this disgusting, I know. I, I rather like it quite a bit, uh, but of course that's personal taste. So that probably is a question like that probably won't be in that style in the exam because it's just well too easy to get a bite wrong and then get a wrong answer. And I usually don't like to ask questions where it's easy to get things wrong uh, just because you overlook whatever or you mistake a zero for an eight or something like this. But the first type of question like, uh, yes, if I really take care of uh, not making errors, uh, that would be a typical question on the exam. All right, so I'll stop sharing and I'll stop 